Ora, muito boa noite a todos, sejam bem-vindos a mais uh, um Seminário XTB, uh, hoje com uma participação especial uh, de Oliver Velas, um dos mais reputados traders no mundo inteiro. Uh, antes de iniciarmos, pedi a todos os participantes que, por favor, colocassem um ok na vossa janela de questões, de forma a que eu possa saber e ter a certeza que me estão a ver uh, e ouvir nas perfeitas condições antes de passar a palavra ao, ao Oliver. Uh, este seminário será em inglês, uh, será em inglês, uh, portanto espero que... O Oliver fala de uma forma bastante clara, portanto não, não se preocupem uh, com, com a dificuldade, uh, da, com a dificuldade da, da, do inglês, vai ser perfeitamente nítido. Uh, qualquer dúvida que tenham, uh, podem escrever em português, se eu vou estar uh, a, ver, a ver as perguntas, portanto eu irei depois passar as perguntas em inglês para, para o, o Oliver. Uh, portanto, qualquer, qualquer dúvida que dão um importante tempo, não se preocupem, podem sempre colocar pela vossa uh, janela, janela de questões. Okay, vou então passar a, a, a palavra para o Oliver. Uh, desfrutem a todos, espero que, espero que vá do, ao, do vosso, espero que seja do vosso agrado o seminário. E já sabem, qualquer dúvida, estejam então à vontade para dispor na janela de questões. Na janela de questões. Ok, um, welcome everyone. Um, I'd like to tell you that I'm very, very proud to be here presenting um, to my Portugal audience. Um, I have a very dynamic presentation I'd like to share with you today. And um, before I do so, before we delve into the material in a very thorough fashion, I'd like to give a little brief background on who I am and how I've come here to speak to you today. Um, I have been a professional trader uh, for the past 26 years of my life. The past 19 years of those 26 years, Uh, I have been traveling around the globe spreading what I call the gospel of trading to any organization and any individual and any group that would listen. Uh, as a result of, of, of my teachings over the past 19 years, I have probably trained more traders throughout the world, both professional and novice alike, than any other Uh, professional instructor or teacher or speaker in this industry. Um, I am the author of um, five international best-selling books, the most popular of which is entitled Tools and Tactics for the Master Day Trader. That book, along with many of my other books, have been translated in seven different languages across the globe and continue to be some of the, the, the most dynamic um, book se uh, sellers in the financial industry. Um, Tools and Tactics for the Master Day Trader is one of the um, largest sellers on the topic of trading the markets professionally from a day trading point of view. Um, I am also the founder of an organization based out of the U.S. called iFund Traders. And iFund Traders is an organization that in many respects has been the culmination of many, many years of teaching and um, promoting the gospel of trading. And it is somewhat of a dream of mine that has been nurtured over the past 10 years or so um, that's, that's finally come to fruition and continues to come to fruition. This organization is dedicated primarily to raising the level of consciousness amongst traders throughout the globe, teaching them the tools and tactics that's needed to handle themselves in the markets professionally. But more importantly than that, it's an organization that is designed to be the support system for the trader throughout his entire trading life. And it's also designed to be the source of funding for each and every one of my students and each and every one of my traders. Over the past 19 years of training traders throughout the world, I've learned that there are four major impediments that stand in the way of a trader's success in terms, and what I mean by success is reaching that place that we call the land of consistency, I should say. 
everyone in the market experiences some level of success. Just the law of mathematics demands that you and I and every single one of us experience periods of winning, winning trades or what have you, but the, but the achievement of consistency, the ability to almost at will and at whim pull profits out of the market um, is the state for the place that virtually every individual who enters into this game we call trading wants to achieve. And the organization that I've put together is dedicated to helping traders try to achieve that, understanding that that achievement cannot be made by every single trader. It's an impossibility. What makes and creates the opportunities, the grand opportunities for the few that do reach that state we call the play, that we call consistency, what makes the 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 potential so great is the, the truth, is the fact, the undeniable fact that everyone can achieve that. But our organization is dedicated to helping traders overcome the four primary obstacles that do stand in the way of most people who will never achieve any degree of consistency in their trading. The most important of which the most important of those four things, one of the most important of those four things, is the lack of capital. And our organization provides full funding for every single one of our students, every single one of our tra traders. We tell our traders that you are a better trader in many respects when you put your own capital away and trade my capital. Something in interesting happens when you have the capital of another person that becomes your responsibility. Something almost magical happens within the individual trader in my experience because they hold themselves instantly to a higher power, a higher standard. We are far it's far easier for us to do stupid things with our own capital because it's our own capital and we only have ourselves to answer to. But the moment you have the capital of a friend or the capital of an organization or the capital of an Oliver Velez, you actually rise a bit taller. You stand a bit taller than you would with your own capital. You're a little bit more careful. You're a little bit more diligent. You're a little bit more disciplined when it's not your capital. And I have found that traders do perform better. They do develop faster when they have the responsibility of caring for another's capital. So our organization not only trains each and every one of our traders every single day of their lives, our organization not only guides them each and every day of their lives, our organization not only provides them with every tool and tactic they need for survival in the most competitive market in the world, our organization also fully funds every single one of our students and every single one of our traders. But that is iFundTraders.com. Um, um, my educational work over the past 19 years has um, been recognized by virtually every financial medium in existence. In 2009, I was ranked the International Trader of the Year by the Munich Stock Exchange. I had my educational work for professional trading firms and regular, normal, everyday traders has been recognized by Stocks and Commodities, where they ranked my educational work the number one educational work in the industry. Barron's ranked my educational work as being number one in the industry. I have appeared on virtually every major financial news program in existence as an expert on the topic of trading the markets professionally. Um, and before we, and, and that, is, that is basically who I am, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I am typically sought, sought after by um, professional organizations very much like this one to address their traders. It is something um, that I delight in every single day of my life, even after 19 years of doing so. I never tire of sharing my experiences 
And what I've come to learn over the past 26 years of, of dealing with the markets every single day of my existence. And today I'd like to give you a small but very powerful piece of some of that knowledge. What I'm going to share with you today is one of the most powerful and one of the most recognized tactics that exists in all markets. What we will talk about today is universal in its application. Whether you play the equity markets or the commodity markets, the futures or the currency markets, the individual market is irrelevant. This event that we will learn to identify and exploit is applicable in every market that exists. It is also applicable and exploitable in every individual time frame that you trade. So whether you are a micro trader that uses two minute and five minute charts to find his or her opportunities, or whether you are a swing trader that uses the daily time frame or a core trader that uses the weekly time frame, this individual event that we call the almighty breakout occurs in all of those time frames across all markets and can be identified and exploited by every type of trader. We will talk about the fact that this individual event happens so frequently that it is talked about virtually every single day in the financial news in one form or another. It is by far the most recognized, the most talked about, the most sought after, the most hailed event in the market's existence. And what we will, what I attempt to accomplish today by the end of this presentation is to teach you how to play it at the highest level possible. Yes, there are many people out there who, who know what it is, who hear about it, read about it, and even see it. But not very many people know the nuances enough to really truly take advantage of it, to allow this event to really make your progress, your results as a trader shine. My, my objective by the end of this presentation is to move you to that place where you're able to, to take advantage of it at that very, very high level. Um, before we get started, um, I'd like to point out the fact that you can get a full copy um, of this presentation. There's no cost to you whatsoever. Uh, by simply going to um, ifundtraders.com forward slash Portugal underscore breakout dot php. And this entire presentation, every single slide and comment is absolutely yours. And I, I give it to you with an, with an open heart. Um, also, before we get started, I'd like to point out some rules here. Every, I have given this individual presentation, along with many others, but this individual presentation thousands of times in virtually every single major country you can, you can name in a variety of different languages as well. And I can, I can tell you that each individual event is never, ever the same. What flavors an event, even though the slides might be the same, even though the words written on the slides and the graphics are identical, what is not identical is my audience. What is not identical are the participants, which really add the spice and flavor to every single event. You are more of the event than I am. I'm the constant, but the audience is not the constant. The audience adds the atmosphere, if you will, um, and your questions go a very long way to shaping and molding how this event will go. And this event needs to be tailored to you, not to another group that I, that, I, that I delivered it to last week or last month or last year. It needs to mean something to you, and the way that happens is through your, through your questions. This group has a collective consciousness. While there are many, many individuals listening to my voice right now and looking at the slides from an individual vantage point, collectively I speak to one person. Collectively you make for me an individual. 
And so for me, when I talk, I imagine one individual, and you and I are one to one, and we are sharing. And part of that sharing does involve an exchange. I hate delivering presentations where I'm just simply lecturing. I want to interact with you. I want to know where your mindset is. I want to know how these concepts are hitting you, whether they're hitting the surface and falling off or whether they're hitting you really deep in your soul and every fiber of your being. If you have a question, anything that you do not understand, it is important that you, that you ask. And this is what adds flavor and uniqueness to every single event. So with that being said, um, let's approach this together, hand in hand, and let's take this journey down the path of what I call the almighty breakout. Okay, And please, uh, guys, interrupt me whenever there are some um, questions of serious import you think needs to be addressed, and I'm perfectly open to that. There are two main breakout facts that I want to share with you. Fact number one, breakouts, as I mentioned quite earlier, are among some of the most powerful, profitable plays in existence. Guys, there is nothing, there, is, there are very few things, I'm not going to say there's nothing, because there's one or two things I can think of, but there are very few things that are, that are more powerful, more potent, and more almost immediately potentially profitable than breakouts in existence. Breakouts are the market's number one playable event. As I mentioned, in every single market across the board and in almost every single time frame. Yet, fact number two shocks many traders. Despite the fact that the breakout is one of the market's most profitable events, if you play it correctly. Despite the fact that it is one of the market's most potent events, 72% of all breakouts fail. Now listen to this. In one hand, I'm telling you that breakouts must be an important part of your trading arsenal. Breakouts must be a part of your everyday trading because they're so powerful, because they're so profitable. Yet, I'm also telling you on the other hand that 72% far more fail than actually work. So, if, so if this is true, how can breakouts be so powerful and profitable if most of them are failures? If most of breakouts actually will lead to you losing money than making money? And the answer is quite simple. 72% of all breakouts fail. They're false breakouts, false moves to new highs, false breakouts above resistance false what I call peekaboo blips into brand new territory only to say, only to laugh later at fooling you. 72% of those fail, but this act or event that we call breakout is still so powerful because the 28% that don't fail, they go on to be super super profitable. So 28% of the breakouts that the market delivers us actually deliver profitability. And when they deliver profitability, they deliver it big. When breakouts work, they are big. When they don't, they're horrible. And 72% of them are horrible. And 28% of them are absolutely astounding. So over the years when discovering this, this was unacceptable to me because what most traders do who actually even get mature enough to understand that the vast majority of the time I take a breakout, I'm going to lose money, but the 28%, 28% I'm going to make a lot of money. What the individual traders who actually recognize that, they take a global approach. Most of them take a global approach to, to, to breakout trading. Understanding that most are going to fail, 28% or so are going to win, what they try to do is just curtail the loop.
percent are very small and are taken off the table as quickly and as swiftly as possible and they focus on allowing the 28 percent that actually start running to run their full distance to not cut them short to maximize that 28 percent so they're willing to accept they're willing to deal with the 72 percent that fail with a simple strategy of the moment my breakout is in negative territory, I cut the head off the trade. I do not second guess. I do not play around. I do not wonder if I should eliminate it. If the breakout moves into negative territory, it's one of the 72%. I eliminate it immediately. If the breakout moves me into profitable territory almost instantly, I deem it as one of the 28% and now my focus is to really milk it and to make it run, to help it run unfettered as long as possible, as long as I possibly can. And so most breakout traders deal with it in this global fashion. For me, when I discovered this irrefutable fact, it was not good enough. And so for my traders, I have a question. How can one distinguish between the breakouts that are likely to fail, the 72% versus those that will likely soar. You see, I want to teach you how to instantly identify whether a breakout that's truly a breakout is going to be eventually is going to eventually join the 70, the group of 72% that don't, that eventually fails. Is this going to be a fail breakout? Or is this going to be the few, the 28% that actually go in and make me big money? Now, by the end of this educational session, you're going to know which breakouts to buy and which ones to bypass. And this is going to place you head and shoulders above most breakout traders who do exactly what I just explained. Breakout trading is something that is very popular with automatic trading systems. It's very popular because it's so profitable when it works. But very few have gotten to the place of being able to identify, to pull out, to pull out the creme de la creme, the best of the best of the best breakouts, so that they isolate the ones that are likely to soar and bypass the ones that are likely to fail. All right? So if there are no questions at this point, I can actually right now start teaching you how to make this distinction. Are there any questions? Just tell me yes or no. And uh, alguém neste neste evento tem alguma questão a colocar ao ao, ao Oliver? Se tiverem que vou colocar na vossa janela de questões. Uh, I I did not understand that. I'm sorry. Can you repeat that? Well, I, I'm asking the, uh, the the attendees if uh, they have any questions. They can uh, they can uh, they can uh, write it on the on the question bar. So okay, I, can, great. Uh, I can pass it to you, okay? Okay, fantastic. So at this point, there are no questions, right? Well, at this, at this point, I think the, the questions you are going to, to answer them in, the, in a quite well. Okay. Correct, fantastic. Okay. okay. Okay, so let's keep it going. Okay, fantastic, great. Okay, now, in order to have a breakout, first, the market must present what we call a sideways base. This is very, very natural and should be very basic to understand. The market must give us a period of drifting or moving sideways. And the traditional definition of a sideways base is a period of time where the market gives us relatively equal highs. And if you can look at my cursor here, relatively equal highs. Yes. Relatively equal highs. They don't have to be exactly equal. So for instance, if this is $20, if the highs are around $20, every high does not have to touch $20. We're talking, generally speaking, the highs are relatively equal in terms of where they peak. 
and relatively equal lows. The lows are generally equal at where they bottom. And so the market gives us, before a breakout, or even a breakdown for that matter, the market gives us a drift sideways with relatively equal highs and relatively equal lows. And traders who are focused on breakout trading tend to wait for the market to decisively trade above the highest high of those relatively equal highs. Now understand that distinction. I'm going to repeat that. Breakout traders who are focused on, on, on taking advantage of breakouts, they traditionally wait for a stock to trade above the highest high of fairly relatively equal highs in a sideways base. And the, the traditional trader will buy into the stock the moment, the instant the stock clears the highest high along the highs of the top of the sideways pattern. Okay? And the traditional trader buys the stock just above the highest high of the relatively equal highs, placing a stop under the most recent low. Okay, understand this. The, the, the buy is above the highest high of the sideways pattern. The stop is not under the lowest low of the sideways pattern. In a different sense, the stop is under the most recent low. So there's a possibility that one of the lows throughout the sideways base is actually lower. But the most recent low right before the stop trades above the highs of the sideways pattern, that's the low that is traditionally used as the stop. And a stop is placed one or two or three cents or so just below that low. So traditional breakout traders, just to repeat again, buy once the stock clears the highest high of the sideways pattern. Once they are in, they immediately place a protective stop under the most recent low that was formed before the breakout. Now that's the traditional breakout approach. And unfortunately, this is the traditional result. Now, my question to you is, what's the problem here? What went wrong? This move above clearly trading above highs into new high territory, clearing it, former areas that have proven to be resistant. So clearing resistance, moving above highs, moving into uncharted territory, but yet, this is what normally happens. So my question once again, what's the problem? What went wrong? Now, before you answer, let's, let me show you this breakout. Now, look carefully at my graphic of a breakout on this slide. Look carefully. And now let's go back to the failed breakout. Look carefully at this sideways pattern versus this sideways pattern. Failure, success. Now let's look at them together. For a moment, I'd just like you to study all the little nuances in my graphic. And we're going to go to live charts in a very short period of time. Of course, initially, I need to demonstrate to you in the form of a graphic, but we'll look at these concepts once we have everything under our belt, so to speak, in the real market with real examples. What's the difference between the characteristics of number one, breakout number one, versus the characteristics of the failed attempt to break out at number two? Look at the sideways patterns. Look at the individual lows 
in each. Something different happened. Look at the 20 period simple moving average of each example. Something's different there. Look at the size of the graphic or the sideways pattern itself. There is something different there. And so we're, what we're going to do, I'm going to take a few questions now, but we're about to delve into the individual specific differences between the breakouts that have a high likelihood of failure versus the characteristics that make up the breakout that has a high likelihood of soaring to huge gains and huge profitability. I'll take a few questions now. Questions? Uh, I'm not hearing anything. Is anyone speaking? But I think uh, the sound went to uh, it out. I don't know. Okay, I have you back now. It was turned out, but yeah, everything is all right now. You can keep it going. Okay, no questions. Okay. 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 Now, let's talk about the individual characteristics. So you can uh, you, you can answer. I can answer some questions. Yes. Okay, so the, I have some questions here. Uh, okay, the first question is, the sideways base is valid in uh, any time frame? That's right. Before, when we first began our discussion, I talked, talked about the fact that the breakout is applicable in every market and specifically in any time frame you choose, whether you choose as small as a one-minute to two-minute time frame or a daily time frame or a weekly time frame. The, this breakout, this the, the act or the event we call a breakout does occur in all time frames. All right. Uh, another one. Um, should we use the simple 20, 20 moving average as the million dollar simple average? Very good question. I get it very often. Um, I use simple. And I'm not saying that other versions like the exponential can't be used, but in all of my years of trading, I found no concrete evidence that the sexier varieties beyond the simple act or perform or produce better results. So I am a simple moving average user. What's more, the differences in each are really not that very great. So understand that moving averages are a lagging indicator they are to be used generally not specifically they are to mark off general trends the slope of those trends and general price areas moving averages are not like glass floors or ceilings that break at the the instantly at the point of contact they should be looked more as like fences that the bulls and bears can lean on. They have some sway or they have some, some slack in them. So yes, simple moving averages are what you're going to view in my presentation here. Okay, last one. Uh, what would, would be the time frame to analyze these real or false breakouts? Any time frame that you choose to trade from. Um, I believe that a trader should be a multifaceted trader, a multi-dimensional trader, um, and not a one-dimensional trader. It's my personal philosophy. I don't believe, and nor do I teach my traders to just be day traders, or to just be swing traders, or to just be long-term buy and hold traders, that sometimes the market is in a place that offers the highest likelihood of success in the smaller micro time frames. Sometimes it's just absolutely silly not to hold on to things in a much longer term way because there are such vast opportunities to make large amounts of money by holding on. We're just in that type of market zone. So I believe a trader needs to have skills and the ability to adapt to whichever environment the market is presenting 
to you. If a market can't go beyond two or three days in one direction and then it reverses one day up, then one day down, two days up, then two days down, but there's no consistency to the flow in one direction or another, that's more of a day trading short-term oriented market. You hit and run like a sniper. But if the market is relentlessly going up week after week, almost day after day, with very few interruptions to the downside, then one must leave the day trading scope or at least add the hold, the holding trades to their arsenal. So one must be able to adjust to whatever weather the same way we do with our clothing. If it's hot, we shed clothing. If it's cold, we add clothing. The same in the market. So my, I say all of that in my answer to say this. When you are day trading, if you use a five-minute chart as your day trading window, then yes, you're going to look for breakouts to occur on the five-minute chart. If you are swing trading at the moment and the daily window is your primary window where you're going to seek your up through which you're going to seek your opportunities, then you're going to look for breakouts on on the, 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 the daily time frame. So whatever time frame you happen to be trading is the time frame that you use, is the window that you use to view the world of the market. And and so yes, you're waiting for breakouts to appear in that window. Now understand this. I use the term you're looking for just as a matter of convenience. I am not really a believer that a trader should necessarily go out searching for opportunity. I believe that a trader should stand still and sit in front of their window. If your window was the five minutes, sit in front of the five minute window. As you would sit in front of a window looking over in your house looking over a beautiful scene in your backyard. S take a chair and sit in front of your window and wait for breakouts to appear or sideways patterns to appear in your window. You don't have to go searching for them. They will come in your window. If you have a list of 10 stocks that you look through the look at through the eyes of the five minute chart, then sooner or later, one of your 10 stocks or two or three of your 10 stocks will form a sideways pattern. They come, to, these opportunities come to you and appear in your window. You do not have to search all over the world for them. I find that traders who will take, who approach the markets this way to perform far better than the searchers. When they're searching to the right, the breakout happens to the left. When they Ah, when they move to the left, the breakout happened behind them. When they turn around, it now happens in front of them. It's like the searcher almost never really wins. The one who sits in one spot and waits for the breakout to occur in his own window, those are the most prepared to seize the opportunity and take advantage of it for full profitability. I hope my, I hope my answer was clear. Any more? Any more questions? Okay, I'm not sure if the voice has gone out. I'm going to take that as a no and move on here, okay? Okay. Let's talk about the individual characteristics and this is this is going to form the meat and potatoes the 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 foundation of 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 your knowledge of how to really play the breakouts as we mentioned before there can be a breakout there must be a sideways pattern the sideways base can occur or should occur in most cases in an established uptrend or the sideways base in the form of a bottom can or should occur after an extended downward trend to the downside. So I tend to be a base player after a stock has rallied to the upside and then bases sideways, 
or decline consistently to the downside and then all of a sudden goes flat in a sideways base after a steady downward move. So these are, in my opinion, the best bases to focus on. Now that is distinct and different from, if you can imagine this, a stock that has rallied from 10 to, to, to 15. So a stock that has rallied from $10 to 15 and has dropped back to 13 and now goes sideways. So it's going sideways in the middle of its rally from 10 to up to 15. That's not the type of base I want you focused on. I want you focused on bases that occur such as this. A stock rallies from 10 to 15 and bases between 14 and $15. It's basing in the upper part of its recent rally or a stock that has declined from 15 to 10 and is now basing near the bottom of that decline. Bases that happen in the middle of trends are very, very, very different. They're very different statistics and they're almost erratic. Almost anything can happen. The statistical odds lay in the bases that happen at the upper or lower end of recent advances or declines. And I hope that's very clear. The bases that form, and let's focus on the, the base that is occurring after a rally. So a stock rallies from 10 to 15 and starts basing sideways in the upper portion of that rally. So it's basing near the high. It's basing near 15. It doesn't have to be basing exactly at the high, but it's up there near the high, and it's basing sideways. Point number two says that base should be narrow and thin, not wide and whippy. We want a thin base, a narrow base, a quiet base, a controlled base. We do not want a wide and whippy and noisy and erratic and volatile base. I want you to understand a concept in the market that is very true and universal for that matter. When a stock, the, 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 the market is very much like a breathing mechanism. It exhales and inhales. When it exhales, it moves very, very big and very, very suddenly and very, very strongly. That's the exhale, strong move. The inhale is how the market rests, takes a breath in to prepare for the next exhale. And so when the market inhales, it gets quiet. The bars get narrow or small. The range gets tight and thin. The exhale, everything expands. In the inhale, everything contracts. And you can't have the next exhale period. You can't have the next explos explosive period without first having the market inhale. So a narrow base after a rally means the rally is the exhale. Now the market goes sideways, and it goes sideways very quietly, very narrowly. The market is now inhaling, preparing itself for the next exhale. So we want the base to not continue exhaling because the market can continue to exhale going sideways if it's wide and whippy. It's still expending energy. We want the market to now conserve its energy, to replenish its energy, to rejuvenate itself. And the way we detect that it's doing that is if the sideways pattern is quiet and narrow. If it's wide and whippy, it's still expending its energy and is going to die. But if it's narrow, tight and narrow, 
and it stays, it is tight and narrow near the top of that most recent advance, that advance is not over. It's preparing itself for the secondary run. Point number three, or characteristic number three, not only should the base be small or tight and narrow, the individual bars that make up the base should by and large be little tiny bars. The bars that make up a rally from 10 to 15, those bars are likely to be sizable. When the market starts going sideways near the high of that advance, you want to see the base narrow and the bars go little. Not every single individual bar, but the vast majority of the bars, you want to be small, little, tiny, little bullets. Not tall trees, tiny little bullets that at the right moment are going to fire to the upside again. So, not only do you want your base to be small, tight, and narrow, you want the bars that make up that base to be abnormally small, the vast majority of them. Here's a rule I want to share with you. Here's a, here's a, a market rule I want to share with you. The market's biggest moves occur from its tiniest bars, its smallest bars. This concept is so important, I'm going to repeat it again. The market's biggest moves occur from its smallest bars. And I'm going to show you this over and over again. That just like acorns produce mighty, mighty oak trees, little tiny bars produce mighty, mighty explosive moves to the upside and downside for that matter. So little bars are very important. They're like the spring that kicks off big moves. If you think about how a sports figure, like a basketball player, leaps very high in the sky, he first squats to get very small, to get smaller. Then he extends his body upward. But it is that crouching, stooping, becoming small that actually prepares for the power to the upside. So small bars, when the market starts producing small bars, look for big moves. And a narrow base full of small bars is going to produce a very, very mighty move. I hope that's understood. Characteristic number four, the volume, this is very important, the volume during the base must diminish. Your volume during the time the stock is moving sideways, you want to witness the volume going down and down and down and down. You want to see a downward drift in volume to almost nothing, which is preferable. preferable. You want to see almost a lack of interest, a volume fall off during the sideways market. If volume stays normal during your sideways pattern, that is more of a top than a pause that's going to lead to a continuation of your initial up move. Let me repeat that. That's very important. If your volume during a sideways base stays normal, stays at normal level and does not drop, does not recede, does not diminish during the sideways base. That is not a base that's going to lead to a breakout. That is a sideways top that is going to lead to a breakdown. You see, your sideways base can be either a pause that will continue the up move or a sideways top that's going to break to the downside. And I'm telling you one of the most important keys is volume. Volume is one of the most important keys. If volume diminishes during the base, you can be during a tight, narrow, sideways base with little bars. You can be rest assured that an upward move, an upward breakout is imminent. If during that sideways base the volume stays heavy, you can pretty much be rest assured that that is more of a top than a sideways pause. 
and that even if the stock breaks out, there's a failure that's likely to happen very shortly. And let me quickly explain why. If you think about what volume is, a lot of people theoretically understand volume. A lot of people in the, in the markets think they understand what volume is or what it really means, the significance of it. But I find it in my teaching of thousands and thousands of traders, I have over 4,000 traders under my tutelage. And what I find is that most traders don't understand what volume really means. When you have a surge in volume, you have a surge in what? You have a surge in two things, not one thing. You have a surge in buying and you have a surge in selling too. You can't have just a surge in buying without a surge in selling. So if volume spikes, the surge happens on the buy side as well as an increase or surge on the sell side. You can't have a buy without a sell and you can't have a sell without a buy. So if buying picks up, selling picks up identically. What can be uneven is supply and demand. What can't be uneven is buys and sells. So if, if volume surges and if buying has picked up and selling has picked up, it means that there is a change of ownership of the stock occurring. So think of a sideways pattern where the volume is surging during the sideways pattern. It means a lot of people are going in, a lot of new people are going in to buy, but a lot of the old owners are selling to these new people. So the old owners that used to own the stock no longer own it, and new owners own the stock. When you go through a period of volume surge, you go through a period of changing who owns the stock. And when you change the owners of a stock, you change the character of the stock. And the action of your stocks will start to change after periods of volume increases because the mindset of the new owners is different from the mindset of the old owners which means the actions from the new owners will be different than the actions from the old owners, creating a different characteristic in your stock. So volume is important in the sense of detecting when you have a change in ownership. And in a sideways, when we're playing breakouts, we don't want a change in ownership. We want the pause breakout. We want the pause base, not the base that is indicating that there are new owners now. New owners are going to create a different direction. I hope this point is understood because it is a very, very important point. We don't want new owners. We want the same people that drove the stock from 10 to 15. They're now taking a lunch break. Now the stock's going sideways. We want them coming back into the market to finish up their work of buying the stock. Breakout. We don't want the, the, own, the buyers that bought that caused the stock to go from 10 to 15 now sell. Now new owners are waiting for new buyers that they don't get. Now the stock goes down. That's a very different scenario. So I want that volume to drop off, which indicates this is not a change of ownership. High volume indicates a change of ownership. Low volume indicates lunch break. A little brief holiday. A resting period. No one's, the stock is not going sideways because people are selling. The stock is going sideways because people are eating. I hope this makes sense. It's a little oversimplified, but it drives the point home. So not only do we want that sideways base in the upper port part of the most recent advance, we want that sideways base to be tight and narrow. We want the individual bars that make up that base to be little and tiny like little bullets. And we want that volume to drop off to almost nothing during the sideways base.
The last characteristic is, is as follows. Ideally, we want that sideways base to not cross over the, 20, the rising 20 period moving average. I want that sideways base drifting back toward the 20 period moving average, but I would prefer for it not to pass the 20 period moving average. The most ideal breakouts occur when the breakout happens at or near that rising 20 period moving average. So if we were to go back to my original breakout example, the successful one, you see that the breakout above the highs occurred near the 20. It didn't occur way over here well before it reached the 20. The mature breakout, the right breakout, the breakout that is occurring at precisely the ideal time is happening at or near its 20 period moving average. Now in Sample number two, you see the sideways base is crisscrossing the 20 period moving average. Whereas the break, the sideways base in number one is basing sideways above the rising 20 period moving average. Now, if, if, if the base in number one kept going sideways, it would eventually look like base number two. It would start crisp. The 20 period moving average would stop rising. After a while, it would go flat and become flat with the flat sideways base, and the stock would start crisscrossing the 20 period moving average. But the best breakouts, the best bases don't cross the 20, and the best breakouts occur at or near, very close to, the rising 20 period moving average. And so there you have it, guys, very quickly. The base happens in the upper top portion of the recent advance, criteria one. Criteria two, the base is tight and narrow, not wide and whippy. Criteria three, the individual bars that make up the base are lar by and large very, very tiny bars. Criteria four, the volume during the base drifts downward, diminishes. Criteria five, the breakout occurs at or near the rising 20 period moving average. If this checklist on your setup, if each one of these items, if each one of these items on the checklist has been met, has been satisfied, and your and your sideways base scenario, you can with great confidence pile into the breakout. And I'll and we're going to talk exactly how to do that. Now, what's the buy action? Once the stock trades, you buy the individual bar that breaks above the highs of the last two-thirds of the base. Now, here's what I mean by that. The bar, the bar, there are individual highs during your base that's being made. Oftentimes, the first high all the way to the left of the base is higher than the rest of the highs. So we don't, I'm not, I don't want my traders waiting for the stock to trade above the highest high of the base. I just want them trading, I want them entering into the stock once a bar clears most of the most recent highs. Now let me show you very quickly that on a chart. Here's what I'm talking about. If we look at this point here, the stock rallies to a high, then drops off the high a bit, drops off the high a bit, and then bases a little off the high. Our breakout is not above the absolute highest high. Our breakout is above the highs made during the last two-thirds of the base, or even the last one half of the base. I'm not concerned with the highs that happened in the beginning of the base. I'm concerned with the highs that have happened in the latter part of the base. The most recent highs 
are my number one concern. And if a bar clears, if an individual bar clears the highs made in the last one half to two thirds of the base, you buy into that bar before that bar finishes. You do not wait for that bar to finish trading and then buy the next bar. You do not wait for that bar to finish trading and then wait for confirmation. You want your money in the individual bar before that bar finishes trading, that the individual bar that broke above the highs. Okay? So let's go back to our list. You buy, once a bar breaks above the highs of the, the last half or two-thirds of the base, you immediately place a stop one penny below the individual bar you just bought. Now listen to me carefully. You're buying the breakout bar and you're using the low of the breakout bar as your reference point for your protective stop. This single bar is the legs under the table of your breakout. This single bar supports your breakout. And if your stock or the market takes out the very bar that, that caused you to buy, it has eliminated the very reason that you bought, and you no longer want the stock. This individual breakout bar, this first breakout bar, is the most important bar of all because it establishes your buy as well as where you place your protective stock. Now, if you think about this, this is very neat because any breakouts that fail on you, you only lose one bar. Every failed breakout that you will ever experience will be limited to only one bar. Think of how magical that be. What if every single losing trade you made for the rest of your life was only one bar? But when you won, you won eight bars or 15 bars or 44 bars, or 22 bars, or even five bars, or six bars, or four bars, but every time you lost, you only lose, lost one bar. You only, you only lost one bar. What if you made that a permanent rule in your trading? I will only lose one bar on every single trade. Just by the law of mathematics, you're going to get eight bar wins, and six bar wins, and 13 bar wins, and 20 bar wins. But every time you lose, you lose only one bar. This is what I teach my traders. Limit your losses to only one bar and let your winners go on for many bars. This is the formula of success in trading. So we buy the breakout bar and also place a stop under that bar itself. If that bar gets violated or taken out, we no longer have the reason to even think there's a breakout. So why stay with the stock? All right? Now, here's a neat little trick. Some people say, Oliver, what can I expect in a breakout? And I've just learned that markets move in a measured type of way very often. No one can ever really truly know for sure when a stock's going to top out or when a, where, how far a stock's going to rally or move. All right, guys, give me just a second here. Okay, no one truly knows how far a stock's going to go, but we have some neat little guidelines that can help us at least come up with some, some fairly decent price objectives. And one of the, one of the ways I, t one, of, one of the neat things we use with bases is we take the individual base, we take the length of the base from left to right and flip it vertically to come up with target number one. Now that's target number one. Now listen to me carefully. We take the width of the base. If you were to take a pencil or a pen and measure the width of the base from left to right, when did the base begin and where did the breakout happen? Measure that from left to right. Now at the breakout point, flip your pen or your pencil vertically straight up and mark off where the high of that pencil or pen is 
and that becomes target number one. Because the market tends to move in measured legs, the sideways base is a leg. The next leg should at least be equal to the last leg. All right, so target one becomes what we call the measured move, taking the length of the base and flipping it vertically to come up with a theoretical target one. That should be a minimum target. Many breakouts will, of course, travel far beyond target one. But this can give you a general idea of what you're dealing with, at least in terms of potential. What kind of potential does this base have, does this breakout have versus this breakout? You might have limited funds and say, well, listen, there are two breakouts happening now. Which one do I take? I can only take one. Well, this one seems to have the best risk reward based on where my stop is and based on where my target one is. So I'm going with this one. Okay, now, I know we're belaboring a lot on this slide before the examples, but it's very important for us to get the foundation in, and then we can start looking at tons and tons of real examples. Now, just to summarize, the best breakouts occur at or near the point of contact with what? The rising 20-period moving average. When a stock is what I call power trending, it will be trending off of the 8-period moving average. Now, that doesn't happen all the time, but sometimes it's, it's either the breakout is happening from a regular uptrend off the 20-period moving average, but if your stock is just trending, trending powerfully to the upside and it is not even anywhere near the 20-period moving average, then put the 8-period moving average on your chart, and I guarantee you that's the key moving average, and any sideways drifts, to your eight period moving average that break out are playable in the midst of a what I call a power trend. So power trends operate off the eight period moving average. Simple, yes, simple. Regular uptrends happen off the 20 period moving average. Any uptrend that is happening lower than the 20 period moving average is not a powerful enough to even perk my interest. I need to deal with uptrends that are above their 20-period moving average, not above their 50, not above their 35, above their 20s. I'm looking for a certain velocity of strength. I don't want feeble or very weak uptrends. I want powerful uptrends. So I narrow down my uptrends. Either I play stocks above the 20-period moving average, and, and when they start to trend above the eight period moving average all the better so the best breakouts occur at or near the rising 20 period moving average or at or near the rising eight period moving average on in power trends all right but let's let's go over some basic things here's the number one thing you have to determine sometimes a sideways movement is a top and not a base that's going to break out to more upside. Here's the way you determine that. Pause versus a top. Pauses lead to higher prices. Tops lead to lower prices. Pauses are narrow. The tops are usually wide and whippy. Simple. Pauses have small little bars, many of them. Tops are made up largely of wide, wild bars. Big red bar, big green bar, big red bar, big green bar. Pauses have light volume. Tops maintain big volume. Pauses usually don't cross the 20 period moving average, and if they do, it's by a little bit, not by much. Tops tend to cross go keep going sideways until they cross the 20 and then they start crisscrossing the 20 many times. These are the distinguishing characteristics between a pause that will lead to more upside and a top that's going to lead to a crack to the downside. And so let's look at the let's look at a graphical representation of our characteristics. Characteristic number 1. All right? Characteristic number one, 
you have a upward surge. So if this is a five minute chart, characteristic number one is the upward surge. All right? Let me highlight that. Upward surge happens first. Criteria number two, your base forms in the upper portion of this surge. The base is not forming down here, way off the high. It's forming not exactly at the high, but it's forming near the high. It's forming in the upper portion of that surge. That's very important. That means that in order for the stock to be able to stay near the highs, there's not a lot of selling or profit taking. The buyers that are, that are even profitable are not taking profits, which is an indication that there's more upside to happen. If they're taking profits, the stock comes down here in min basis. In order for the stock to be able to stay near the upper portion of its range must mean that this is resting, not profit taking. There's a difference. There's a difference when traders leave for an hour or two for lunch versus the stock is going sideways because look at all these sell orders coming in. How can the stock rally with all these sell orders? There's a difference. No selling, resting versus the stock sideways because there's a lot of selling. Okay, criteria, that's criteria number two basing at or near the upper part of the range. Criteria number three, all right, so tight, narrow, sideways base, not wide and whippy. Your base is not occurring like this. Your base is not occurring like this. Your base is tight, narrow, thin. I, we, in my stick figure, we're not looking, but another characteristic, the bars inside of that base are largely, most of the bars are little and tiny. Next criteria, the volume drops off. Look at in my figure how during the sideways base, the volume gets smaller. Okay, beautiful. And the best breakouts occur when they break out and break out above the highs at or near the point of contact with the 20 period moving average, which is this blue line. Okay? So we have all the perfect makeup of a breakout. The trader is waiting now for the individual bar to clear these highs. Now, figure number two here is very important, and it's the last theoretical thing we talk about, then we go to real examples. Breakouts when they do occur, tend to happen in three parts. And this is very important. Part number or three phases. Phase number one of a breakout is the initial move above the highs. Phase number one. This is the move that typically immediately puts a breakout trader into profitable territory. So they've caught the buy point above the highs perfectly. They place their stop under the low of the breakout bar, and they get a several bar run immediately to the upside. They're in profitable territory. Phase, then comes phase number two, which is confusing to a lot of breakout traders. It is almost a collapse, sometimes all the way back to the initial breakout point. And this often erases much of the gains accomplished by the individual breakout trader who bought the breakout correctly in the first place. Many traders, because this pullback happens sharply, or because this pullback comes all the way back to their entry point, they do not want to lose, so many of the traders eliminate the trade on the pullback. And as soon as they eliminate the trade, the biggest move of the entire breakout occurs which is always the second move. The second move in a breakout is the biggest. I'm going to repeat that two more times. The second leg of a breakout is the biggest move of all. The second leg, not the first one. 
the second leg. So it is the move up after the first pullback that actually has the most of the meat of your breakout. Yet most traders get knocked off the trade on the pullback. So here is what my traders are taught. When you buy the individual breakout, when you buy the initial breakout, Sell some or all of your play on the initial move if, there's, if you get advancement enough. Take some profits off the table on that initial move, understanding that you're likely to get a pullback. On the pullback, if that pullback does not, here's very important, guys, listen carefully. If that pullback, does not violate the 20 period moving average and starts to move back up to the upside again, buy it again. And this second buy in this area, this second buy is in many respects the most important buy because it's the buy right before the second leg, which is usually the tallest and the longest. Not always, but usually. Now, whenever I explain this, some traders say, well, Oliver, if the second move is the big one, why are we playing the first one? Why are we fooling around with that one? Why are we fooling around with the small one and not just sitting around waiting for the pullback and then we pile into the second one and take advantage of the biggest and the best one of all? Why don't we play it that way? Because here's why you do not want to do that. Many times, your first breakout is going to, the first breakout move is going to do this. Then your pullback is going to happen here. Why would you want to miss this? That first one's not always small. But if the first one is that big, the second one's going to even be bigger. But I don't want to miss the, the big first ones too. I want every upward leg. I want the first one and I want the second one. Now, there are times when I don't always sell at the top of the first one. If the first move is little, I may not, I may not have had an opportunity to sell. I'll just add to the second one. Add. So if my first move was not big enough to take profits, but I get the pullback, and it starts moving up again without violating the 20. You can't violate the 20 period moving average. That's the key. It's the key that your second leg is going to be true if the pullback does not violate the 20 period moving average. If that 20 period moving average halts it, you're going to much higher prices. So I'll add, sometimes I buy, I don't get a chance to take profits at A, pullback, that does not violate the 20, starts going up again, I add on the second opportunity, and now I have a bigger, beefier play. Sometimes the move to A is big enough to take half off. On the pullback, I put the half back on, and then take advantage of the secondary surge. Now, I hope this, I hope this makes sense. Are there any questions on what I've covered this far before we start looking at example after example after example? We've put the foundation in. We know the characteristics that make up a good, nice 28% breakout possibility. You know the characteristics of what a 72% breakout sideways pattern might look like. Are there any questions at this point before we move forward? Uh, <clears throat> we have some questions here, uh, Oliver. Uh, the first one, uh, where to put the stops? Can you draw it? Uh, I, I need, let's look at, we're, we're, these are stick figures, so when we go to individual charts, you're going to see exactly where the stop should be. So that's on the next slide. But if we want to... Uh, okay, yeah. yes, yes, yes. 
Okay. Uh, if, if you are going to answer the, the next slide, we, we can uh, we can. Uh, okay. There's another another question. Uh, can we apply Fibonacci to analyze the legs? Can we apply Fibonacci to exactly analyze the ratios? Yes. Yes, you can. To place targets. Yes, I'm 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 a very big believer in Fibonacci, but not to the silly degree. There are there are many traders who take the whole general concept of Fibonacci too far. I think they're just too, in my opinion, it's my opinion, they're too esoteric and, and too mystical about it. Um, I use the broad strokes of Fibonacci um, to come up with things like, you know, the pretty much near the halfway mark and you know, I use the two thirds and and, and so forth and so on. My moving averages tend to be Fibonacci in nature. I use the eight period moving average. The 20 period moving average is just a rounding. In real pure Fibonacci theory, it's the 21 period moving average. Um, the moving average between the eight and the 20 that can be useful is the 13 period moving average. Um, I tend to take profits at, if there's a five bar, five consecutive bar move to the upside without an interruption, it's time to take some off the table. That's a Fibonacci number. So I use the broad strokes of Fibonacci to make decisions in the market, but I don't take it to the point of view where I'm a, I'm, I'm, I'm a Fibonacci scientist and every single thing must be Fibonacci matched and things of that nature. I think you can take it too far. Okay, the last one. Uh, if the indicators like the, stoch the stochastics of or the air SI are not in the concert with the trends, do we invest the same? Yes, I believe you do. I believe that you can, um, just like Fibonacci, you can place too much emphasis on, on indicators that are supposed to confirm. I believe that the price is always far more important than a secondary or third based indicator. Remember, the indicators are derivative of the price, so the vast majority of your decision making should be based on price and volume alone. If you've had a nice strong move to the upside in the stock and your base is not occurring in the, has not fallen, uh, the stock has not fallen all the way back to the midway point of that advance and is now basing, but is basing near the highs and is basing tight and narrow and the bars are quiet and the volume's dropping and your 20 period moving average is rising and it and the stock has not crossed the 20 and now you find yourself very close to the 20 and a single bar pops up and surges above the highs of your sideways base there is no indicator in the world that would stop me from buying that now also under, understand that breakout trading if applied properly is very low risk trading because you're only risking one bar so even if you have some conflicting things, why not just go for it? It's go if you lose, it's going to be a small loss. I find that traders are try to be too careful to, uh, to, to avoid losing trades. When I find that the trader who is more prone to just give it a shot but is disciplined in eliminating the trade when they're supposed to eliminate the trade, will not only increase their odds of success, they increase the number of opportunities they're going to have. We think ourselves out of our opportunities far more than we should. My traders know that I have a very strict saying, when in doubt, buy it. You just need to be disciplined enough to eliminate it when it needs to be eliminated. So if you had, when in doubt, if you're in doubt, Take a shot at it as long as you know exactly where the stop is and as long as you know you're disciplined enough to take it. Take the trade. Take the chance. There's a statistical odds that there's a 50-50 chance at worst that you're going to make money or lose it. And if you're playing the right patterns as I teach you, there's an even higher chance that you're going to really make the money. So. If you have a conflicting indication from an indicator you like, but my checklist is perfect, basing near the high after an advance, narrow base, little bars, volume drop off, breakout near the 20, do not let your indicator stop you. Please, trust me on this.
Okay. Any others? Okay, we can keep it. Uh, we can keep okay. it going. All good. Fantastic. Okay, great. I think now, uh, I think the other the other questions are going to be answered next. Great. Okay, let's take a look at let's take a look here. We're looking at a at the symbol doesn't really mean anything. It's this this stock's called Liberty Global Inc. L B T Y A. It's a five minute chart that is significant. So each bar represents five minutes of trading, and this is the start of the day. This first five minute bar is the start of the day. And as you can see. It started off with a bang. The first five minutes of trading is very powerful. And the first move in general, the first leg of the move was very powerful. Now, notice, just like my drawing, rarely will you get a base that happens exactly at the very tippy-top high. That's just not normal. Usually, there is a drifting off the high a bit, but not much, and then a settling down and resting. Now this base meets the criteria, right? We have a base that is occurring at or very close to the, at is, is occurring in the upper portion, not in the middle of the move, not at the bottom, but at the upper portion of the recent advance. Remember what I told you, stocks cannot stay in the upper portion after a strong move upward if there's a lot of profit taking. So what this means is that even though many traders are profitable, they're not taking profits in large numbers. They're waiting and, and banking on higher prices. If they weren't, they'd be selling, and this would turn downward. Okay? So remember, you can't have a base in the upper portion unless there's a... a if there's a lot of profit taking, there's there's very little profit taking going on. That's why the base of the stock is remaining in the upper portion of the recent advance. Now the base is tight and narrow, not wide and whippy. It's not like this. Okay, the bars that make up the base are tiny. Look at how tiny and little compared to the bars during the advance. Look at the advance. Look at the bars. Now look at the bars. That's called resting. Okay? That's not called finished. That's called resting for my next advance to the upside. Notice how the volume goes from chunky to smaller to smaller, to almost nothing. There's a collapse in your volume during the base, which again tells you there's no change in ownership. There's no lot of buying and a lot of selling. There's no, if, a, if there's a lot of selling, there's a lot of people getting out. All right, there's no getting out. There's waiting for higher prices. This is a very, very positive sign. Okay? So, your volume has dropped off. Now, the only thing I'm not showing here is I'm not showing a 20-period moving average, okay? But if your stock has drifted back toward a 20-period moving average, the closer it gets to the 20, the more ripe the base is. See, if a breakout happens here, it's likely going to fail because it's trying to break out too quickly before it is really rested enough. Think of this as a marathon. The stock has run a marathon. Now it's resting before it runs its next marathon. But it can't rest for five minutes and then try to get up and run another 27-mile marathon. It needs a decent period of rest. We know bases have rested enough when they have approached near their 20-period moving average. Now breakouts can happen with a certain crispness, a certain power, a certain certainty, because the base tells us the stock has used time to regenerate itself, to rejuvenate itself. All right. I hope all these things are coming through clearly. So 
if I were to ask you where your buy point is, I'm sure you'd be able to tell me. Your buy point is not above the absolute high. That's where the rest of the world buys. The rest of the world gets alarms that go off on this stock above the absolute high. Ah, new high. Uh, LBTY, new high. Ding, 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 ding. But I want you in on, see the last two-thirds of the base? The highs are here. You're in above, you're in at about 42.16. That's your price. 42.16 in this area. And then when the stock gets to make a brand new high, the rest of the world buys here to help lift you higher. But you're already in a little bit earlier. Okay, the rest of the world buys breakouts of brand new highs. You buy breakouts of the highs of the most recent part of the base. All right? Now, let's take the next example. So, you know, we're going to get to the actual buy. I'm showing you the setup now. Now, here we have the same criteria, five-minute chart here, the same criteria, guys. Notice criteria one. There's a surge to the upside. Criteria two, the base settles down in the and starts basing in the upper part of the advance, not in the middle and not at the bottom, okay, in the upper part of the advance. The base is tight and narrow, not wide and whippy. Next criteria. The bars that make up the vast majority of the base are tiny. Not every bar, but if you look at the majority of the bars are little compared to the size of the bars during the rally. That quietness is important. You have a drop-off in your volume. We go from a spike in volume here down to almost, well, let me just do it this way. The spike in volume here down to almost nothing. Spike to nothing. During this drop off in volume and this sideways drift, your 20 period moving average continue to rise to meet the sideways drift. And just about now, you are salivating. Just about now, your finger is on the buy button. Right now, your finger's on the buy button. Saliva is dripping onto your keyboard and all over your fingers, but you dare not wipe for fear of losing the exact moment to strike, which is pretty much one penny, it looks like. Remember, we take... We go back the last two-thirds, and this part of the base is what we focused on. One more penny, and we strike. Okay. Now, here's, a, here's, an, here's an important point. The question was, where do we place our stop? Now, there are two options for stops. When the breakout bar is, is like this, let me show you. When the breakout bar is like this, from the from here to there and now you're buying you're going to buy like this you're going to buy into this bar here you're going to buy and you're going to place your stop under one penny or two pennies or whatever under the low of that same bar okay but if you have a breakout scenario like the one we're having now where the bar that's actually may break out is going to break out, it's going to start almost at the breakout point. What if your next bar is the breakout bar like that? Okay. You can use this individual bar as your stop again, or you can decide to use the base to be a little bit more liberal and place your stop under the narrow base. This is your personal choice. 
you can use the individual bar stop approach or you can use the stop below the entire sideways base. Now understand that's never going to be far because your base is narrow and tight, remember? Your base is not wide and whippy so that the stop way is way below the lows because your base is wide. Your, your base is tight and narrow so your stop is close. But this is your personal choice and I will tell you that what I do personally is I do either or. Sometimes I use the bar stop and sometimes I use the base stop. It depends on the difference. Sometimes the difference between the bar stop and the base stop is so negligible that I just go the base. I go with the bigger one because it's the difference is so small. But if the difference is great or if I'm uncomfortable with what I would lose by going with the base stop, then I'm going to go with the bar stop. I'm going to place the stop a few pennies below the bar that I actually just bought. And in most cases, the, 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 the breakouts that really, really work do not violate their breakout bar. In most cases, they, don't, they do not. So I hope the stop question has been answered. All right? But we are at or near the point of contact with the 20, and this is the perfect time if the breakout happens... Now, we're buying. Stop here. Oh, that's a little too far. Stop just under the low. It's hard to draw from it. Or stop under the base, your choice. It's your personal choice. Okay? Again, interrupt me if there are any questions to be had here. Okay, I'll leave that for your reading later. Here's another example. We have criteria one. Let's go over the criteria again. I'm going to drill this until it's, it, it bleeds from your ears. Surge to the upside. Sideways base, not in the middle, not at the bottom. Sideways base occurs in the upper portion of the most recent advance. That base is tight and narrow, not wide and whippy. The bars that make up that base are far smaller than the bars that made up the move to the upside. Tight and narrow base, little tiny bars by and large, volume drop off during the base, 20 period moving average continues to rise. The stock drifts to toward the 20 period moving average. And at or near the point of contact with the 20, the breakout occurs. This is a perfect criteria-based breakout. The breakout didn't, notice how the breakout tried to happen earlier. Look, base, pop. Do you see that? Let me do it. Let me do it with this pen. Sideways base. And then this move is an attempted breakout. But it's too early. It's too premature. Look at where your 20 period moving average is. And this is why that move petered out very quickly and didn't go anywhere. But it is now that we've approached near the 20. It doesn't have to touch. Just come near. We know this base is right now. Breakouts are real. Now, you do not wait for your breakout bar to finish trading. You're buying at this point, the moment it crosses your stop. Now, look at what you're risking. This is what you're risking, this little space here. All right now, that looks big because we're, we're dealing with a, a relatively high price stop. But and relative to the chart itself, that's a very, very small stop. You're dealing with a very, very tight stop system with breakouts. You do not risk a lot on breakouts if you play them correctly. Okay, stop goes under that bar. The, the bar, that 
first bar puts you into profitable territory because your buy was here. And your stop got immediately placed on your low, risking small for the great. This is how you stay in the game a long time. Your systems, your approaches must contain almost scientific rules for entry and stop. The art part of trading is the sell. But your buys must be scientific in nature and your stops, your initial stops, must be scientific, meaning they must be rule-based. Selling is where the art part of the game comes in, but you do not want to be artsy with your buys and with your stops, with your initial stops. Now, I want you to take a look at this slide. Let's take a moment and just stare at this chart. Let's take 10 seconds. It's so perfect. I just want you to stare at it. Look at it. To me, it's like a Picasso, a Rembrandt, a Monet. It's beautiful. Let's go over the criteria once again. Guys, this is on a five-minute chart, a daily chart, a two-minute chart, a, an hourly chart, a weekly chart, whatever time frame you trade. Remember I told you that the market's biggest moves happen from its smallest bars? Look at this. Look at the size of this bar. And then look at the move that happens from that little tiny bar. Powerful. Surge to the upside. Now this is almost doubling in price, yet there's still more upside. Some people say, Oliver, how can it be more upside? There's been, the stock moved from almost $3 to, to, to $5.50. It almost doubled in a few days. This stock is over. It's finished. It needs some rest. And I say, well, yeah, but the pattern's telling me there's more upside. How? The base. The stock did not drop then base. The stock just stopped going up and took its rest right near the high. That is not a top. Tops don't act like that. The base is tight and narrow, not wide and whippy. If this was a top, it would be more like this than a crack. but it's tight and narrow. The bars go from being this chunky and big to this almost non-existent. Shoot, I need glasses to even try to attempt to see, is this a red bar, is it a green one, is it? Wow, they're so tiny. The volume goes from spiky to almost nothing during the base. During the base, the 20 continues to rise. The drift sideways does not cross the 20, but yet at or near the point of contact with the 20, the breakout occurs. Now, your buy is not here when the stock finishes. Your buy is as soon as it clears these highs, not this high, not the tippy-top high. Remember, go back two-thirds. There's that Fibonacci concept again, right? Go back about two-thirds. Now just focus on this part of the base. When does it clear the highs of the last two-thirds of the base, the most recent two-thirds of the base? Find your highest high in the last two-thirds of the base. But you only do this once you've approached the 20. You don't start doing that here, too premature. But once you've approached the 20, now go back. Once you've approached the 20, now go back two thirds. Now go back two thirds. Once you go back two thirds, all right, 
forget everything here and focus on everything here. Find the highest high in that base. Now, the, a penny or two above that high is your buy price. That's scientific. Go back about two-thirds. Now, find the highest high in the, in, in the section that you're focused on. One or two pennies above that high is your buy price. Once you're in, your stop is under the low of the bar you just bought or, if you choose, under the base. Under the base. Beautiful. Here's one that's not as clear, but still should be able to be seen. Criteria one, the surge. This tells us, gives us the first sign. Now, guys, there are tactics and things in intraday trading where we take advantage of the initial surge, too, but that's beyond the scope of our talk. We're talking about the secondary move after a surge, which is normally a breakout. It surge first. We come off the highs a little bit, sideways base. All right? Some people might say, well, Oliver, what about this attempted move here? Should I have tried to buy? The clearing of this base? No. Look at the distance from your 20 period moving average. It's too immature. At or near the point of contact, your best breakouts are going to happen near your 20 period moving average. Now understand if this stock keeps going sideways, that 20 period moving average starts to drift sideways and go like that. Now that's more of a top potentially. But if it never violates that 20 period moving average, and that 20 period moving average is rising, and during that sideways base, look at what happened. Your, your volume goes real small here. And at the breakout, it starts getting chunky again. You're dealing with the right thing. Some people ask, well, Oliver, how often do you get these perfectly formed bases after surges and this and that? More than you can possibly play. Do you know that this statistic shocks people? That the market spends almost 80% of its life going sideways? That just doesn't even sound right, does it? When you look at long-term charts, you don't see that. You see ups and downs and ups and downs. But when you peer into the bars, most of the bars are made up of sideways movements. So as an example, let me show you this. I'll show you this. No, that's wrong. Not what I want. I'll show you. Here's a bar to the upside. Okay? That's an up bar. And let's say that's a daily up bar. But that bar tells us that the stock opened here and closed at the high here. But it doesn't tell us how it moved up there. Did it move up there intraday like this? Did it move first as a surge in the first part of the day and then spent the rest of the day going sideways? Or did it do this? Did it, did it go sideways first most of the day and then in the last part of the day surge to its high? That's one example. This is another example of the same bar that can look the same. Or did it do this? Did this bar that looks like this on the daily chart, one solid move up, did it intraday do this?
So sometimes going inside of the bar to reveal how the bar was formed is very, very powerful analysis because this is very different from this or even this, which all make the daily bar look the same. Same thing for a five-minute bar. If a five-minute bar looks like this, how did it form? Did it, did it go like this for four minutes and then the last minute surge? Or did it go like this for the first minute and the last four minutes it didn't do anything? Or did it zigzag up the whole five minutes of the way? Or did it do this, 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 then that? So every one of those scenarios is very different, right? Anyway, let's go back to the, let's go now, let's look at a power surge scenario. Here's a scenario where the stock is trending so powerfully, the 20 period moving average, it's not drifting to. The 20 period moving average is irrelevant. There's just no retesting of the 20 period moving average. So we do take break, clear breakouts off a rising eight period moving average if a stock is demonstrating that it's power trending, all right? And our breakout bar after a sideways drift into the eight is clearly here in the circle. Our stop goes under the breakout bars low or under the base. That base is tight and narrow in the upper portion of its advance. It is preceded by an advance, sideways drift, breakout, Stop. Okay. And whichever moving average your the breakout is happening off of can become your trailing stop moving average. So because this breakout is occurring off the eight period moving average, as you move into more and more profitable territory, you can start trailing a stop using the eight period moving average. And that goes a little bit, a, a tiny bit beyond the scope of our talk here because the talk here today is to really focus more on how to identify which breakouts to play and which not to and how to play them, how to enter them, how to protect yourself. And then you let them run with a basic, with a basic trailing stop method using the moving average that is most relevant. The breakout is occurring off the 20, that's the 20 period trailing stop method. Breakout is off the eight, it's an eight period moving stop method. And then there are all other types of cell rules that I need you to know, which we cover a little bit more in our next presentation in the next few weeks. But I, but just to very quickly mention, trailing stops are your safety net, but there's, they're not the ideal way to sell. A trailing stop is in place just in case the stock starts collapsing on you. But you really want to sell up there. You don't want to sell on bad movement. You want to sell on good movement. All right, we talk a little bit more about selling in the next presentation than I give you. If there are any questions, please interrupt me here. Please interrupt me. Here's another power trend, another power trend example. Initial surge to the upside first. Drift sideways. Now, some of them aren't going to be as clear as my little stick figure examples, but you should be able to zoom in and see what a drift to the sideways, a drift sideways is. And you can... For the sake of analysis, you can ignore the little wicks on the bars and just look at, you can ignore the little wicks on the bars and look at the, look at the, 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 look at the concentration of your bodies. See the concentration of your bodies is here. This is your base. The wicks in Japanese candlestick parlance the direct translation of what we call wicks on the candle are shadows 
Shadows are not the real thing. Shadows are cast by the real thing. So we can, in some cases with our analysis, ignore the shadows and go right to focusing on the real thing, which is the bodies. And so when I, my breakout point is not above the, the wick. My breakout point is above the bodies in this case. The bodies. All the bodies. I need all the bodies to be cleared. I don't need this upper wick to be cleared. I need the bodies to be cleared. Stop right under the low of the bar you just brought. You don't buy it here. You don't wait. You buy once it crosses. Being early keeps your stop, keeps your wrist little. Buying here, now look at now look at your risk. It's still one bar, but it's bigger. I'd rather this risk than this risk. So don't be afraid to buy early because that keeps your risk small. Now because you're buying off the eight, you can, once you get into nice profitable territory to protect some of your gains, you can ride, you can start trailing with the stop, trailing with the, trailing with your, um, your moving average. In this case, because we're breaking out off the eight, the eight becomes your trailing stop. Any questions? Uh, <clears throat> no, by, by this time there's no questions. Uh, I'm um, I'm answering them individually in our question. Uh, okay. So you can uh, you can keep it going. All right. If you feel there's something that uh, um, you feel it's best for me to answer, I'll, I'm certainly I'm, I certainly want to do it. Okay. Yes, of course, of course. I will I will interrupt you by the time. Okay. okay. Now, this is what I mean by most stocks spending most of their time. This this two minute chart is a two minute chart. This two-minute chart is really making a solid move to the upside. And if I were to take this part of the chart and, and consolidate the bars into one giant bar, it would look like a solid up bar. I can't draw very straight. But look at how it's this solid up bar spent most of its time most of the time is sideways. And this goes for everything in the market. Even your strongest trending markets, if when you go inside, most of the movement is sideways. There's only abrupt advances. One or two bars here, one or two bars, one or two bars, and then rest, one or two one bar rest, one bar rest, two bars rest, one bar rest, two bars rest, one bar rest. If you add up the time, the times the stock was r rallying versus the times the stock was resting, it's like five to one. So most, when I tell, when, when a trader says that, how many opportunities will I find with this? More than you have money to play because most of the time the market's going sideways. And so what's a way, what's one way to search for these things if you're out to at least narrow your world? Like there are 15,000 things that trade every single day. Like how do you narrow your world? So I usually, I usually have my traders do this. Every, each of my traders has a watch list. And if you don't, you can use a generic watch list like the NASDAQ 100 or the S&P 100, something like that. You can use an index, the Dow Jones 30, or you can create your own watch list, right? Your own index. So let's say we take the S&P 100, and I sort at the morning before the open. I so, I have this. I have all the stocks of my S&P 100 in a list, and I sort that list in um, descending order, which means that the stocks that wind up being up most will be at the top. The stocks that wind up being down the most will be at the bottom. 
So my winners are at the top, my losers are at the bottom of my S&P 100 list. Okay? So after about the first 20 minutes of trading, I take the top five stocks in that list, the top five. This top five, I then look at individually, let's say, on the time frame of my choice. Let's say it's a five-minute time frame. And I'm looking for stocks that have had criteria one. What's criteria one? Do you remember? The initial surge, no? That's criteria one. Which stocks this morning, over the past 20 minutes of trading, have given me, let me get a nice intraday one, have given me a nice solid surge. And so I, 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 I collect four or five initial surges, stocks that have rallied in the first part of the morning, the first part of the day, and are still at or near the highs. And then I watch them develop. You see? And one may drop out because it starts to decline. Now I've got four that's still drifting near the highs. The 20s are still rising. All right? The, this one gets eliminated now because it starts getting wide and whippy. Now I've got three left that's still continuing to drift toward their rising 20s. They're still remaining tight. The bars are small. The volume's narrowing. And as the stock approaches the 20, I look at the market. The market's starting to heat up after, after a, a 30 or 40 minute rest. Other things are starting to go. I'm right at my 20. These three stocks, two of them have now drifted right toward their breakout points. It's getting ready. It's getting time. I'm looking at my time in sales. I'm seeing the time in sales start to speed up. My buy points two, 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 my buy points two cents away on this one and three cents away on my other one. Boom, the two cents one hits. I strike. I put a stop immediately in place under the low of the bar. Three minutes later, my second breakout play strikes. Boom, I'm in that one. Now I've got two breakout plays going on. Stops are in place. Watching them develop. This one's off the 8 period moving average. My second one's off the 20 period moving average. And I have a simple rule. You need a minimum of five consecutive bars after your buy that remain above your moving average. Then you can convert to trailing stop mode. Before five bars, you must remain with your initial stop in place. If the stock stays above the 8 or stays above the 20 for five bars after your buy bar, you can now adjust from your initial stop to now trailing stop. And for me, a violation of a moving average happens in two bars, not one bar. Just because one bar pokes below your 8 or your 20 period moving average does not mean it's a stop, a stop out. You must get a confirmed second bar that breaks the low of the first bar that violates the moving average. So bar number one pokes through the 20 period moving average. Bar number two trades lower than the low of the poke through bar. Now I'm out. It's a two bar break system, not a one bar. How many times have you been trailing stop and one bar knocks you out only for that to be a fake? Eliminate your fakes with the two bar rule. All right? Okay. Let's see here. Here, I. I prefer, especially in the beginning, I prefer you to focus on the breakouts to the upside after a surge, after a rally. They offer far higher odds of continuation. But there are times to apply the breakout concept to a bottom. And so let me quickly explain how you buy a breakout bottom versus a breakout continuation play which is what we've been talking about all along, continuing 
the breakout continuing the initial surge. This is a complete bottoming breakout approach. First criteria is that you've, of course, been moving down. Now the stock starts going sideways, right? Tight, narrow, little bars. The little bars indicate lack of interest at the bottom. No further interest in the stock. Okay? Here's the key point. At or near the point of the contact with the 20, there is a high likelihood of another move down, just like the reverse. This is very likely at or near the point of contact with your 20. But if, and here's the caveat, if the sideways pattern continues to go sideways despite coming in contact with the 20, continues to go sideways, and then starts to pull the 20 along with it, to starts to flatten the 20 out. And if the 20 becomes one with the sideways trend, now a breakout is right. Listen to me carefully, ladies and gentlemen. If playing a bottom breakout, if your breakout happens to the upside near the, the declining 20, that is a fake. Do not buy that. That's going to do that. The way we know it's mature enough, the way we know that all the selling's finished is that the 20 goes flat and becomes one with the stock. And sometimes it, it, the bottom is so secure that the 20 actually goes flat and slips beneath the price. But you need to buy bottoming breakouts only if the 20 is flat and at least is at one with your stock. Not going downward, not sloping downward. Breakouts of basis from a sloping downward 20 MA are fake breakouts. That's your 72%, not your 28%. So notice when the breakout occurs, the 20 is flat to slightly rising. This is a solid bottoming breakout buy. Stop goes under. We buy at the point of the arrow. The stop goes under the bar that I'm breaking out. Look at what you're risking. How much are you risking here? You're risking pennies for the possibility of bars. There's nothing more powerful than the breakout. There's very few things more powerful than playing breakouts purely correctly because the risk is so small and the potential gain so great because it's coming from a compacted market position. Little bars, tight and narrow base is a compact position. And the market goes from expansion to compact. Expansion to compact. After compact must come expansion. After contraction must come expansion. I don't know if in Portugal they sell slinkies for children, but as a child I had many of these things, many of these slinkies. And when the slinky is at its widest point, it only has one other choice, to go to its most contracted position. And when the slinky is at its most contracted position, its only choice is now to go to its, its, its an expanded position. When the market goes from, look, when the market goes from, look at, look at, look at my concept in, in, in play here. The market goes from expansion, wide, fat, long bars, to contraction. From contraction, it goes back to expansion, just in the opposite direction this time. So expansion, contraction, expansion, contraction, expansion. And that's all the market is. And part of your success in it is learning how to read the contraction, the periods of contraction, and how to exploit the, the upcoming 
expansion and to know which direction the expansion is likely to come in. See, if expansion happened here, I know it's likely downward. If expansion happens after the 20 goes flat, I know expansion is likely upward. Okay? If Here's that same chart in continuation, guys. So we're going to continue the same chart. Hold on. Here's the, the expansion to the downside, big bars, contraction. Uh-oh, here's an interesting point. Doesn't go down, continues flat. Then we get our first, we get our breakout opportunity. We place our stop here, we buy here. Now we get a nice powerful surge up here that's big enough to take some profits off the table. Let's go to the next slide. And what you'll see is that you profit taking can happen in this area. Because we know the likelihood after we surge away from the 20, we're likely going to pull back toward the 20 again. Right? So we take some off the table on the surge away from the 20. I usually don't sell all on a breakout. I usually sell half or so. On the pullback toward the 20, I'll reestablish my buy. Now, one simple general rule of reestablishing your buy is you find the most recent fat red bar during the decline. Here's a fat red bar, but here's the most recent fat red bar during the decline. Mark off the high. And when the stock takes out the high of that, that's a new breakout buy. So you put your half back on. So if I sold half here, I'm putting my half back on here. Now, because this is occurring near the 8, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, now I can start trailing and protecting from any potential drop to the downside. But I'm letting this run. Now, look at what I risked. I risked this amount here from my buy point to my sell point. Look at what I risked for this potential gain. And we're still, look at the difference. We're still rallying. It's still not finished yet. So I risked, let me do that again. I risked this amount. And I like to, I like to demonstrate them in, in circles, but it's hard to draw with this instrument here. I risked this amount here. This circle represents my risk. And this circle represents my gain. Now look at the size of each. That's how you stay in business in this game. That's how you become a success in this game. When your wins have the potential to be that much bigger than your average losing trades. Losses on breakouts played my way are always very tiny. But when the wins come, OMG, that stands for oh my goodness or oh my god, they're usually very big. The nature of breakouts when they work are big. Your job is to make sure that when they don't, they, your losses should stay small. Any questions at this point? So far, everything okay. All, all good. Yes, everything okay. I'm, 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 I'm answering um, the, the questions individually. Okay. Uh, from what you are saying, so I'm trying to, to, to do a little job okay. here to develop the attention to the clients. 
So notice there's always there a lot of times on your breakouts you're going to have your one, two, three, you're going to have the three parts, the initial breakout, the pullback, and then the secondary leg. Remember I told you the second leg is the big one. And, and as a statistic, I find that generally speaking, the second leg is about twice as the length of your first one or more, but it's at least twice. So do not miss the second leg of your breakout. You'll be leaving the vast majority of your, your gains on the table. Now, speaking of bottoming breakouts, again, remember I told you, look at, look at the period during the downward slope of your moving average. You see, that's the period of your downward slope. But it is only once the 20-period moving average goes flat and becomes almost one with your price that breakouts can be believed. See, they can't be believed here. They can only be believed here when the stock is almost at one with your, with your price. They're almost identical. They're touching each other consistently. Now, breakouts are real. You can clearly see what your breakout bar is. It's the first tall green bar. You did not buy toward the high of that. You actually bought toward the low of that bar as it cleared the highs of what? The whole base? No, never. Only the last recent part, the last half or so. That's all you concern yourself with. You're buying where this arrow is pointing. Your stop is under the low. And there's your move. Now up here somewhere, maybe you think about taking half off the table. And if it doesn't pull back, okay, you get the, the gains on your next half. But if it pulls back and does not break this 20, that's the key. You're going to put the half back on for the secondary leg. That's how we play bottom breakouts. Or some of these examples that I'm going to show you when you, can, when you get these. And guys, very quickly, what I did very quickly was I pulled out some trading results at different levels. Each of my traders has a profile. Some traders are trading with small amounts of capital, like 10,000 US dollars. Some traders are trading with as much as $11 million and everywhere in between, okay? Um, here are tr traders that are just breakout traders, just breakout traders. They do not trade any other tactic. And so here's a trader in a single day using a very small amount of money, piecing together uh, not a lot of money. It's $119. But... It's a very small number of shares, and it's only playing breakouts. Now, I want you to look at how, okay, the breakout he played on X produced $34. Now, again, he's trading tiny because he's got a tiny account, right? They have to prove themselves. This trader can go from $10,000 to $20,000, $30,000, to $50,000, to $150,000, and so forth and so on. But he has, to, he has to reach certain levels. So... Look at his wins. Okay, RIM was probably more of a break-even trade. Maybe his stop was violated. ME was another winning breakout trade. And then he had a couple losing trades where the stop under the breakout bar got hit. But notice, whenever he wins, look at, look at the $4 win on RIM when it, when it was RIM. Um, look at that as just a breakout. That's just a breakout trade. That's a break-even trade that didn't work. The, he's got three winners and really two losers. But look at the size of the losers and look at the size of the winners. When you're playing a pure breakout strategy the right way, your losers are always going to be a fraction of your winning trades. All right? Here's another breakout trader who's at a different level. He has $30,000 in mind power. Okay? Now, if you look at the first guy, he had, he had you look at the first guy, he had 10000 He traded a total of 4,000 shares. I don't know if you see these numbers here. He traded a total of 4,000 shares, right? 
produced $119. That is net of, a, of, of, of expenses and everything. Okay? This guy has 30000 using this strict breakout strategy, traded 7,800 shares in total, had no losing trades, but had breakouts in the micro time frames in all of these symbols on this given day. This is a one single day. Okay? Produced $555. Just doing breakouts. Now, in all fairness, these guys have primarily they have primarily three windows up. They have a two-minute chart, a five-minute chart, and a 15-minute chart window up. And they're usually playing breakouts off of the two and the five-minute and using the 15-minute for support and resistance analysis and stuff like that. So sometimes they're playing a two-minute breakout, which is going to produce a smaller gain than maybe a five-minute breakout will. On this stock, a five-minute breakout is developing, but on another stock, a two-minute breakout possibility is developing. So maybe the maybe you can see the smaller gains like the the 176 gain this trader had here and the 192 are probably the five minute breakout plays these are probably two minute breakout plays right here is a trader now at the one hundred and fifty thousand dollar mark he's trading with $150,000 account, right? He traded a total of 30,000 shares that day. He netted a, a little over $1,000, $1,008, right? Had a decent flow of wins. These, these, the six, the, he had probably, to me, these are break even trades. Like when you look at the 17, you look at these, these are kind of just trades that probably were profitable and kind of just stopped them out for close to break even or a little bit when he was trailing or whatever the case is these ran these ran a little bit okay, these breakouts ran now he had some losing breakouts too the ones that basically these are ones that basically just you buy the breakout bar you put the stop under the bar and your stop gets hit right there's nothing you can do about it a percentage of those will happen but look at the Look at the size of the losers versus the size of the winners. The ratio is amazing. Here's straight winners from from a guy. I don't know what uh, I don't know what level this guy's on. For some reason, we didn't grab the, the the image correctly. But consistent. Some days the breakout. Some days when a, when the stock when the overall market is just running and running and running. You can get breakout after breakout after breakout after breakout. You can play two or three breakouts in the same stock on the same day. And if you're playing three or four stocks and have two or three breakouts for each one of the three or four stocks, you have a pretty active day of breakout trading on your two and your five minute chart for nice gains on a, on a market day. Now, I always show this slide, age doesn't matter. We have junior traders that are between the ages of 10 and 17 years old during our junior trading program. Here's one of our 10 year olders, breakout trading. All right. They're not perfect. As you can see, this is a no no. You don't have gains of 200 and 300 and losses of 200. You just, that is a no no. So he obviously. His, his, this, his name is Cruz, by the way. Cruz obviously let one of his trades go south too far. But when I, the first thing I look at is, I want when I see the average gain is like three hundred dollars, I don't want to see a loss of two hundred dollars. I want to see a loss of fifty and sixty dollars if my average gain is thirty dollars. I don't want to see lo gains and losses equal. That's just gambling to me. All right? There's actually another 10-year-old trader who has it more correctly. Didn't let a trade. Most of his gains this day, he had, he, he's trading 100,000, traded 3,900 shares that day. His, most of his gains came on the first trade, BIIB, 
breakout, notice how the size of the losses compared to his winning trade is very, 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 in, very small, very small. This 900 is probably a five-minute breakout play. The other wins, the 116 and 136, are probably a two-minute breakout play. They're going to produce smaller trends, but you get a, more of them. So you got three on the two-minute and one on the five-minute. Right? Then some of our bigger traders, guys, are trading big shares. Look, 214,000 shares produced $8,000 in breakout trust profits in a single day. This trader, 10,301 trading day, very consistent, made 5,000 on one breakout play, made 3,000. It's just bigger shares, guys. That's all it is, bigger shares. Traded 71,000 shares. The moves aren't that much different. It's just bigger bigger positions. That's all. This trader traded 140,000 shares, produced $10,000 in that single day breakout trading. So just showing you that there, we have colonies of traders, and some one one of our colonies of traders is simply purely breakout trading. That's all they focus on, and you can utilize this one concept, this one tactic, this one tactic to really make a living in the markets if you get it down right. And the key is being strict as you possibly can with that initial stop. The market takes care of the rest. Right, and there you have it, guys. Once again, let me just skip through this stuff. Once you get, once again, um, this stuff you can read through once you get the presentation if you like. If you are interested in getting a full-fledged copy of this presentation, all you have to do is simply go to to ifundtraders.com forward slash Portugal underscore breakout dot php and the presentation will be emailed to you in PDF format. And I encourage that you do that and mark it up and, and take notes on every slide. Let the patterns sink in. Look for them in your market. Look for them in your time frames. All right? And um, paper trade them first. See how it goes. See how the breakouts happen on the two-minute versus the five-minute. Don't miss your bigger time frames too. They don't happen as often, but breakouts on the daily time frame are very, very powerful. And, and there, there are quite a few examples in the presentation on that. So I hope this has been helpful for you. You should by now know the characteristics of a pure breakout pattern, the ones that will typically be part of the 28% that win versus the 72% that lost. Additionally, you know what constitutes a, a pattern that's likely to be one of the losing breakouts. All right, you know, should know precisely when to strike and how to and instantly protect yourself to keep your losses very small. You know, after five bars above your moving average, you know when to trail and how to trail and what moving average to trail on. You know how to take a list of stocks and after the first 20 minutes of trading, find the surges up or down. Find the surges and then collect the surges and then eliminate as they deteriorate. So some are going to start producing big bars. You eliminate them. Some are going to start getting whip wild and whippy after the surge. You eliminate them. The ones that stay true to the, to the criteria. They continue to drift back toward the 20 period moving average. Tight, narrow, little bars. The volume continues to remain small. Maybe you start off with eight surges and get down to three that remain the way they're supposed to by the time they get to their 20 period moving averages. Now you've got three possibilities. When the breakouts happen, you know when to strike, how to protect yourself, when to trail. And you should be well on your way. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Oliver. Um, I think uh, I think the, the attendees are, are all clear about this strategy. Um, if uh, if they have any questions, uh, they can they, they are they are uh, writing those questions in the the questions uh, windows. So I'm going to individually uh, answer them. 
but thank you very much for your for your time and we we hope to see you next uh, next week